you know what about this project, if especially I have the association uh, of opening the treasure box, which was hidden for many years. You open, you unlock it, and then you have this wow feeling. Like, how is it possible that it was hidden for so many years? Thanks God that our language survived, that our folklore survived, our songs survived and I think this is also the reason that the nation as a nation survived. Музыка выникла від мови української, а не просто так, щось хтось придумав там. I can really relate so much to it because the, the words are really powerful. Uh, it's basically a continuous prayer that you can you can't have you know you can basically have an amen to. And then if you start digging in the history, and then you find a lot of tragic things and and very tragic history of all these composers. This piece by Lysenko, who was around the same time as uh, Tchaikovsky. And, I mean, Tchaikovsky's music to me is, of course, very well known, and Lysenko's is not. I think it's just so sad that uh, still we are so unaware of the treasures of the many composers in Ukraine. I was so happy to finally have a good chance to, to show that you can make a difference in the world, not only by playing music, but also to use your, your music to work for peace and try and show the world the, what they haven't seen before, what they should see. Pianist Natalia Pasichnik performs all over the world and lives in Stockholm. But she returns frequently to her native Ukraine. After the Maidan uprising in 2013-14, she has become passionate about putting Ukrainian music on the map. I am living in Sweden more than 20 years, and uh, of course um, it's a country which I like and love, but you know, it's like in my situation, it's like having two children and you, you love them very much, both of them. But the, the, this child which has more problem, you, you, it needs more love. So this is the situation about Ukraine. Of course, in this situation, both my heart and my mind and everything is with Ukraine. Natalia invited a group of top-level Swedish musicians to a recording of Ukrainian chamber music. Ukrainian journalist Valentina Romanyuk decided to document her journey and invited Swedish colleague Sofia Nyblom to join the team. Together, they embarked on a project to rediscover Ukrainian history through its music and its composers. Between performances, Natalia often returns to her hometown Lviv, the cultural capital of Ukraine. Here, she attended the music boarding school and later the music academy, during the period when Ukraine broke free from the Soviet Union. At the academy, Natalia took her first steps as a pianist and learned about the Ukrainian composers whose music was never performed in the Soviet Union and is unknown even to this very day. There are, of course, historical reasons uh, why Ukrainian music is unknown. Um, the bigger part of Ukraine belonged to Russia Empire for hundred, many hundred years. And as an artist, if you wanted to make a career and uh, be famous, you had basically one choice. You had to go to Russia and become their artist. And this is how we know he, them uh, in the West. For example, Bulgakov, Gogol, Malevich, Repin, and the list is very long. 
Um, but those who stayed and tried to develop the national school, they basically could count only on if not being killed or sent into Siberia, uh, in best case, just being ignored. Valentin Silvestrov is revered for the fragile poetry of his music. Despite being expelled from the Union of Composers and denied publishing in Soviet times, his music today holds a wide international appeal. I think Silvestrov is a very underrated composer. It's about him Arvo Pert said that if he would choose one contemporary composer, he would choose Valentin Silvestrov. Uh, that his music is wonderful, but most of us will understand this much later. Despite his claims of being apolitical, the events which unfolded during the Maidan Revolution affected composer Valentin Silvestrov deeply, to the point where he changed the style of his writing. Valentin Silvestrov was on the Maidan from day one and observed the mounting tension. He heard the Ukrainian national anthem being sung, sounding more and more like a prayer, and he was inspired to react. <laughs> Я взагалі такий асоціальний був, а політичний, але ця ситуація. І я на майдані був і бав з першого дня. Я бачив, як це розвивається. І зараз виник великий цикл. Називається Майдан 2014. Це акапельний хор, і це 40 більше 40 хвилин. І там і він там структура така гімни і малин. І молити, і це це такий код, який на майдані був. Вони співали гімн і читали молитву. Georgian star violinist Lisa Bachashvili performed on the Maidan on the day of independence, one year after the Maidan uprising. I felt from the first day, first moment when I arrived in Ukraine, that it was one of the most peaceful uh, country that I could imagine. The people are peaceful and kind and generous, and this is really almost impossible to imagine that there is war in this country. Du vet, för mig skulle man kunna dela självklart livet före och efter Majdan. Det var ju... Det var väldigt starkt på, på, på alla sätt och min, jag kommer ihåg att jag har ju kancelerat flera av mina engagemang för att jag helt enkelt kunde inte åka och göra mitt jobb ordentligt. The recording project of Natalia Pasichnik has been planned in close collaboration with her sister, singer Olga Pasichnik. When the whole um, drama in Ukraine started around two years ago, um, for everyone who has just a drop of dignity and um, compassion, it's it just uh, simply impossible to wake up and to go on stage knowing that in the same time someone is dying for you to make this possible for you. Det som artist är väldigt lätt att, att bli sån här anpassningsbar och anpassa sig för att man vill så gärna uppnå någonting med, 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 med sitt yrke, med sitt karriär, med allt. Men nu kom det så nära den här förändringen i världen så att man kunde inte bara leva vidare och spela sin Mozart och må bra utan man var tvungen att ta ställning. For me, 
me and for Natalia was very important to choose the music we love, we believe in, we believe in the beauty of this music and the power of this music, that this music can convince the West Europeans that the Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian music, it's still huge terra incognita, but what a beautiful one. We choose in this project to gather uh, music by composers who share the same tragic fate. For example, uh, everybody knows the Christmas uh, song, Carol of the Bells. La 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 la. But not many people know that this is Ukrainian composer, Mykola Leontovich, who wrote it. And uh, he was killed by KGB in his 30s. Uh, and this fate was common for many Ukrainian composers. <laughs> Due to the suppression of Ukrainian identity, the main format for Ukrainian music has been the intimate, the music of home and of traditions. Because of this uh, family traditions, uh, we still have um, people sitting around the table and they sing their folk songs. But still in Ukraine, this tradition survived. The only chance to survive before you, 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 you will be killed is just to speak your language at least at home or to sing some folk songs, to talk to your child. Um, The constant struggle to defend the Ukrainian musical identity is also about remembering the music of the past. Classical Ukrainian composers have traditionally been forced to subscribe to the Russian historical narrative under threat of incarceration, exile or death. Mykola Lysenko is for Ukraine what Sibelius is to Finland. And Lysenko's music is a cornerstone of Natalia Pasichnik's project. His home in Kiev was the cradle of the Ukrainian Romantic School of Composition. Men det är ju helt otroligt känsla vara här. Här är det hans instrument som han satt och komponerade. Det är från 1895 så självklart det låter inte som nysten, var precis. Men det är väldigt, en väldigt speciell känsla vara här faktiskt. Mykola Lysenko was a key figure in the birth of Ukrainian classical music during the Romantic period. He established a music academy in Kiev, and his own music is infused with a melos of Ukrainian folk music. The Lysenko Academy of Music became a hothouse for the Romantic Ukrainian imagination. The Ukrainian club, a meeting place for poets, musicians and writers, inspired each other and gave birth to a narrative of Ukrainian cultural identity separate from the Russian. Ну, це був центр не тільки музичний, взагалі наш музей видатних діячів. Теж унікальне місце – це український Парнас. Він записав близько, ми не знаємо знову ж точну дату, не все збереглося, але не менше півтора тисяч народних пісень. 500 з яких він свої аранжировки видав за життя. Lysenko wrote nearly 90 songs based on the poetry of Taras Shevchenko, and his defense of the memory of this iconic poet actually became the downfall of the Ukrainian club. The authorities forced the composer to close it in 1912 under accusations of propaganda. Він помер через три дні після закриття українського клубу. 
і в записнику, де він тільки підраховував витрати, збоку є запис, тут можна подивитися, ліквідаційне засідання. When Mykola Lysenko was buried in 1912, more than 100,000 Ukrainians followed the funeral procession through the streets of Kiev. The event heralded the start of the first Ukrainian mass demonstration against Russian oppression. In this piece uh, called Dumka Shumka, Lysenko was inspired by uh, Kopzars. It, it's a sort of Ukrainian traveling troubadours. They went from uh, town to town and sang historical songs um, accompanied by a special Ukrainian instrument, Kobza. And in uh, 1937, um, Stalin uh, gathered all of them to a sort of conference in Kharkiv, and uh, all of them were killed there. Der förutom att vara chant, det är om man översätter för ungerska betyder också en tanke. Så det är ungefär så som man tänker, man berättar. Den här första delen som är så långsam, det kan man nästan höra alla den här drian, 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 den här. Du vet från från äh, Kobza och och sen väldigt så här citativ melodi. Och sen till, till kommer den här sjunka som är bara en väldigt äh, eldigt folkdans som går snabbare och snabbare mot slutet. Jakob Korani is one of Sweden's foremost cellists. He associates the language of Mikola Lysenko with a sentiment in the music of another composer of Ukrainian descent. This piece by Lysenko, who I think was around the same time as uh, Tchaikovsky, and they're not the same, obviously, but they share a lot of the same sentiments or similar sentiments. During his lifetime, he, for instance, he wrote an opera with uh, the Ukrainian language being sung, and it was not allowed by the Russian Empire. He was not allowed to, to have it performed and unless he changed it to Russian. And This piece is ex extremely beautiful and uh, lyrical and melancholic, I'd say. It has the uh, power to grab your heart, I think. People have lived through war and conflict several times over the past centuries. They were forced to battle against each other because of the territory being split between different empires. The Austro-Hungarian, the Polish-Lithuanian, the Russian and the Soviet empires. Ukrainian attempts to claim independence have been beaten down time and again. The Russian intervention in 2014 is the first to intercept independent Ukraine. It's quite easy to sing when you play with when I play with you. <laughs> you make it much easier for me. 
Opera singer Lutando Kwave was born in South Africa, but is a Swedish resident today who performs extensively on major European and North American stages. He identified immediately with the sentiments of Mikola Lysenko's setting of Shevchenko's testament. As a South African myself, I grew up under partly from apartheid, which is the system that really was segregating against uh, black people and, mm. and whites at the time. So to, to read that, uh, that poem, it really, I can really relate so much to it because the, the words are really powerful and uh, the frustration and all what is going on into the context is really incredible to, to read. It's basically a continuous prayer that you can you can't have you know you can basically have an amen. Anything that I'm wishing for is not necessarily happening, and it's not something that looks like it will happen. So yeah, that's that's how I understand it. And. Uh, no difference to me if I shall live or not in Ukraine, or whether anyone shall think of me mid foreign snow and rain. It makes no difference to me. In slavery I grew mid strangers, unwept by any kin of mine. In slavery I now will die, and vanish without any sign. I shall not leave the slightest trace upon our glorious Ukraine, our land, but not as ours own. No father will remind his son or say to him, repeat one prayer, one prayer for him, for our Ukraine. They tortured him in their full lair. It makes no difference to me if that son says a prayer or not. It makes great difference to me that evil folk and wicked men attack our Ukraine once so free and rob and plunder it at will. That makes great difference to me. If you see the map of Ukraine, then you will understand much more because the geographical position of the country is just um, very tragic. Because in one side it's fantastic, the climate is great, we have the mountains, we have the seas, we have everything. But on the other hand, you know, you're surrounded from so different neighbors and this part of Europe was constantly increasing the appetites of all the neighbors around. That's why for centuries, either from east, either from west, we have been occupied and we have been divided. Once uh, you're occupied, of course, you always feel that your culture is number two. And it doesn't give any possibilities to real developing of the country, of language, of culture, of education. Det är ju en tröst 
Och egentligen när man tänker att 99 procent av ukrainsk musik är väldigt tragisk och är skriven i mål. För att sånt var livet, sånt var historia. Så den här constellation som är tröst är skrivet i dyr. Men de här suckorna i början eller genom hela, hela den här sticket som går faktiskt i dyr tycker jag är nog väldigt starka. Viktor Kosenko is my personal favorite. He managed probably better than his colleagues. I mean, if he was not killed, he was not sent to Siberia. And it's probably because he lived all his life in a small provincial town in the central part of Ukraine and made his living by playing piano to silent movies, avoiding right big monumental works like symphony or opera. Han var inte sån här som Lysenko eller till exempel Koles att han använde mycket folk eh, baserat på folkmelodier utan det är mest eh, väldigt eh, kosmopolitisk musik kan man säga, romantisk. Och... Det är nog en av de få stycken som, som, som har den här slutet som är lite... One of the pieces chosen for Pasichnik's recording project is the Carpathian Rhapsody by Miroslav Skorik. My first instinct was this is a great encore piece or the final piece of a concert. And then when I started to, to rehearse it and play it more, I realized it has much more, it has so many other colors as well. A huge element of both the Ukrainian folk music and also a lot of klezmer from the Jewish communities, which, I'm, which I love to play. Composer Miroslav Skorik spent many summers in the Carpathians and has found musical inspiration in the folk music of this region. І тому я був знайомий із тими наспівами, так що це мій район. Скорік has always some extra chord in the middle, some secret stuff going on, different color change. And you can't really put your finger on exactly what it is, but it grows on you very fast. I would love to, to hear more Ukrainian music after this. For me, it has been, as I said, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know I loved it before I played it. Another important ingredient in Skorik's music is the element of exile. For generations, the Skorik family has been exiled to Siberia due to political reasons. My father was born in Poland. 
Він брав участь в повстанні проти Росії в 63-му році і був засланий в Сибір. Мій діду, він був у Львові, він був також інтелігентом. І вже в 1915 році він теж був засланий в Сибір. І мій батько, і моя родина в 47-му році також були заслані в Сибір. Так що бачите, що була складна ситуація. Swedish violinist Christian Svarvar associates the mood in Ukrainian music with a sentiment common to Swedish music. Uh, there is a word in Swedish that I like. Um, it's called vemod, and it's it, it's um, it's not really melancholia. It's some sort of uh, still sadness or inner sadness or something. I wanted to play the most tender. Um, I wanted to to um, to give the piece that, that shimmery and and still this completely uh, inner tenderness. And this violin that I changed to a, a very fine Italian old violin had a, a, a voice that I th thought blended much more to the music and to, to Olga's beautiful voice. Most of these composers which we are trying to show to the world now, they had very, very tragic history and uh, tragic lives. Uh, because for composer, what is the most important thing that your works are accepted and you can hear them live, and you can hear them live in a good uh, performance. And the biggest tragedy when you never heard them or they are not accepted, not they are just banned. For example, if you take Latoshinsky, you can drive parallel to Mahler, Wagner, French Impressionism, and still very Ukrainian sentimentalism and use of folk melodies. It's a figure who should be on the, on the top list of all the composer, composers of that time. А якби зіграли його, наприклад, третю симфонію в тому в Берлінській філармонії, де акустика, у нього оркестр Вагнеровський, треба акустика. Це видатний твір, от, третя симфонія. Вона, вона перевершує там, ну, є знаменитий Сибеліус. Так це, 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 це не, не, не гірше, це висока музика. When I first got the music, I, I didn't realize how beautiful it was. I, I had no recording, I, do, I knew nothing about the composers, and so it was a great joy when we rehearsed a few days ago and I realized how extraordinarily beautiful it was. Um, I chose to play a small prelude by Vasil Barvinsky. It's just his first opus, but you already can hear how ingenious this composer was. Um, but in 1947, uh, KGB uh, destroyed all his works and uh, sent both him and his wife to Siberia. I am a composer without musical notation, Vasil Barvinsky is to have said about himself 
due to the complete destruction of his original scores at the hands of the KGB. After returning to Lviv, he started to renew his sheet music. The name of the composer was rehabilitated a year after his death. However, the music of this composer was banned for a quarter of a century. Nikola Lysenko's foremost student, Kirill Stetsenko, was active during the liberation movement 100 years ago. Much like Lysenko, he infused his music with Ukrainian folklore. Kirill Stetsenko was arrested in Tsarist Russia, after which the Bolsheviks closed his choir studio. <laughs> often think that if the history would be different, uh, the second piano concerto by Levko Revuzki would be at least as often played in concert uh, house uh, as Rachmaninoff second. But instead, uh, when his brother, very famous Ukrainian musicologist and ethnographist, uh, and his brother's entire family were killed by KGB, um, he basically stopped to compose. that this is just a first project and we, we will come to piano concertos. At least now it's a first taste of Ukraine. It's quite easy to put on the, the, the right emotions. It really makes me understand exactly what Ukraine is going through right now. I think it's important to lift that cultural identity to show people that this is actually extremely similar to us, to me. I feel very honored to to have been a part of it, to be a part of it. I think it's just so sad that uh, still we are so unaware of the treasures of the many composers that are living and dead in Ukraine. For us, this music is so much connected with our history, with our uh, drama, with our emotions, with everything what we have from our childhood. I choose to name this project Consolation because music probably was the only consolation available for all these composers during this difficult time. It's a consolation for Ukraine as a nation always been, and it's a personal true consolation for me. Thank you. 